So my title here is A Little Taste of Types. Uh, we've had a couple of talks already which used Idris, and I saw much boasting on Twitter that Idris had gone mainstream because <laughs> there were multiple talks that used it. But this is not a talk about Idris to any way. There's no advanced features. There's nothing about how we can use dependent types to encode state machines and do cool stuff. There's nothing about how to use it in practical software development. Instead, I want to give you a little taste of the ideas that lie behind dependent type theory and the ideas that you might need to know eventually if you want to understand the inner workings of a language based on dependent types. And why might you care about a language based on dependent types? I mean, as I said, Idris is now mainstream, according to Buril on Twitter. But, uh, but there's not just Idris, right? I mean, Agda is also a wonderful system that's really fun to work with and has lots of advantages and is at the sort of the forefront of new developments in type theory. And, and Koch is uh, the, you know, the 800 pound gorilla that doesn't get talked about enough where they've actually managed to make a fully formally verified C compiler that doesn't introduce any bugs in its optimizations. That's super cool. And, and many of you are also using the, the big mainstream language, Haskell, in which the siren song of dependent types has proved to be a bit too much and it's slowly drifting toward those rocks. Uh, <laughs> so you should be prepared to swim. But dependent types go back much further than Koch. Um, actually, really, there's, there's a few momentous events in history which, which led to us being able to use them when programming. And it, I think it's important for us to know a little bit about our history. Um, this all goes back to uh, Brouwer, who's, uh, I'm sure I'm saying his name wrong because I can't pronounce Dutch at all. Um, uh, sorry? I, I don't think it's that. But. <laughs> In any case, uh, so he, he had this, this notion of what mathematical objects are. And Brouwer's notion of mathematical objects are one in which humans are important, right? Like, if you kill everyone who knows math, there's no more math. Because mathematical objects exist in our minds. They're, they're mental constructions. It's not some sort of arbitrary game played with symbols or some eternal, inaccessible truth. And, and this, this sort of philosophical approach gave rise to what they call this, the school of intuitionism, I eventually. And there it remained for a while, skipping over various other momentous events that unfortunately I didn't have space for here. And in the 1970s, uh, Per Martinlöw developed Martinlöw type theory in, in various different versions, starting in the early 70s and all the way up to sort of the, the 80s, where it began to take its modern form. And Martin Luther type theory is sort of at the core of everything that we're doing with dependently typed programming today. Um, and meanwhile, in France, we got the calculus of constructions. And there's been a lot of uh, cross-fertilization between the calculus of constructions and Martin Luther type theory, which uh, culminated in a, the type theory behind a system called Lego, which was UTT, which I believe was short for universal type theory, although I forgot to look it up. And, and that's the system that actually was behind very powerful things like Epigram and Agda and even Idris. Like these are all implementations of UTT behind the scenes. And, and work continues. We have cubicle type theory, homotopy type theory, and all these wonderful things. But we also have pi. So as Budil said, uh, Dan and I are working on a, this book on dependent type theory. And these big systems, they, they, they get out of your way. They, they automate a lot of things for you. And systems with a lot of automation are great for getting a lot of work done but they don't necessarily expose you to actually what's going on, and they can make it a little harder to learn it. So we made a little language for a little book where you can have all of this front and center. Um, and it's pi like the dessert. So let's, let's take a little taste of pi. Inside of pi, we have programs. So one of these programs is the number five. And when I type in the number five, I get a little green check mark down in the corner. And I think it looks black on the screen here, but it, it is green. And the, the little check mark means everything's all right with that program. It's, it's a nice program. I understand what it means. And down at the bottom, we can see what the machine's understanding of the program is, which is that five is the result of the program five, but it's also the kind of thing that we call nat. So nat describes five, and nat is short for unnatural numbers, where, sorry, for natural numbers, because any number less than zero is unnatural. Um, but we have other programs than just five. We can also write programs like biscuits, if I can type. And biscuits is a kind of program called an atom, which 
is old-fashioned Lisp lingo in some, in some parts of the world for what we call symbols usually today. Um, and the syntax that it's putting out, where it's saying what kind of thing my program and its result were, I can use that myself. So I can say the nat five, or I can say the atom gravy, and we get back the same answer. If I were to say the atom five, we've got a problem, right? It, it expected an atom, but it got a nat. That's no good. Uh, likewise, atom and nat are themselves programs. So I can type in nat, and we see what, what kind of program is that? Well, that's a type, because it's the kind of program that describes other programs. We have more interesting types than just nat and atom, however. So I could say the pair nat atom, and then I say cons five, four, five, <laughs> five. Um, and now we see once again that we get our green check mark and everything's A-OK. -okay. And I could even say something like the pair atom atom, and this is of course not correct. And I can come back and say biscuits and gravy. And this means something very different in the United States than it means in the UK, by the way. <laughs> I highly encourage you to check it out at some point in time. Um, not only do I have access to pairs, I also have access to functions. I can say the arrow nat nat lambda x x. And now I've gotten back that lambda x x is a function that I can give it a nat and it'll give me back a nat. And I could say the arrow nat atom and then say here, food. But types are more than just things that collect programs into boxes. Types also tell us which of their programs are the same as the other programs that are in the box. So if I say check same, I'm asking pi to tell me are four and four the same with respect to Nat's notion of sameness. And indeed they are. Whereas if I had said four and five, then I would find out that the expressions four and five are not the same Nat. And I might also want to say, check the same, pair Nat Adam, cons four, four, cons four, four. So all of our types tell us what it means for them to be the same. And this isn't just the trivial thing that it may look like, because I could also write plus two, two here, and it still works. So in other words, running programs is part of what it means for them to be the same. It's not all of it, but it's a big part of it. So I'm using plus here, but I haven't actually shown you what plus means. So if I want to define plus, the first step in pi is to say what kind of thing it is. And I do that with this form called claim. So I say, I'm going to claim that plus is going to be an arrow nat nat nat, which is to say that I give it two nats and it gives me back a nat, which I think is a reasonable specification for plus. And now I can say define plus and put in a little placeholder. And a little yellow question mark box down here in the corner means your program might be okay, but it's not done yet. And if I want to look at my placeholder, I can see that I need to make something which is an arrow nat nat nat. I do that with lambda. So I can say lambda j k. And if I were a schemer, I might write something like if zero ha j uh, k otherwise plus of sub one j, k, and then remember to wrap this in an add one. But unfortunately we find out that if is an unknown variable. So I can't use my technique from scheme in pi. And that's because we don't have Booleans, actually. <laughs> but if I want to rewrite this, I do have an operator which lets me check which nat I've got. So I can say which nat j, 
And what which nat means is I give it a nat, and then if that nat is zero, then it will give me back this operator, or this operand. Otherwise, I give it a function and tell it what to do with one less than j. So I can say here, lambda j minus one. Um, for the, for the non-lispers in the room, you're allowed to include things like dashes inside of names. And then I'm going to say add one of plus j minus one k. And this ought to do the trick, except for the fact that plus is not a known variable yet. How could that be? Well, it turns out that in pi, recursion is just not an option. Hey, Dan, why isn't recursion an option? Yeah, but why isn't it an option? Yeah, but, but why is recursion not an option? Recursion is not an option. I think you all get my point. <laughs> um, if we want to use our programming language as a logic, if we want to encode reasoning as well as just computation, then it, we need to rule out infinite loops because you can put an infinite loop in any old type and that leads to big problems eventually. And I'll point out some of those as we approach them. So instead, we have safe forms of recursion, ones that always do work, right? Because plus isn't actually gonna be an infinite loop. It goes down by one until it hits zero and then it's got an answer. And that form of recursion is captured by something called recnat. And recnat takes not only a smaller nat, in the case of add one, as an argument, but it also takes the result of doing the whole recursion on the next smaller nat. So we'll call that sum so far. And now we say add one of sum so far far. And I get a green check mark. But a green check mark is not enough. I want to add some numbers. So I'll say plus 2, 2. And we see that it is indeed 4, as we had hoped. And note that I never used this j minus 1 here. So we've actually got one more convenience form built into pi where we can omit it. And that's called iter nat. We've defined addition. But types are much more than things like just atoms and pairs of atoms and nats and functions. Types can also represent statements. And then the programs that are classified by that type are evidence that the statement is actually true. It's, those, it's the computer version of those mental constructions that Brouwer was talking about. Sometimes I think he'd be spitting in his grave when, if, if he ever found out that his uh, intuitionistic mathematics, which put humanity in the center and mental constructions, was running on computers. Um, it's kind of fun. <laughs> but in order, to, in order to provide evidence that 2 plus 2 equals 4, I use another kind of program here. And that program is called same, because the reason why they are equal is that they are the same. So I can say same 4. And because 2 plus 2, 4, and 4 are all the same nat, this is suitable evidence that they are equal. If I were to put a 1 here, then this would no longer be evidence that they are equal. But note that this program here, the type, it's perfectly OK. I mean, it's OK to say you know, 1 equals a million. We're just never going to be able to provide any evidence that that claim actually is the case. And likewise, I could come here and say, plus two, one, and down here, three, and I need a parenthesis. And then this also works, because computation is fundamentally a part of sameness when we're dealing with type theory. But that's not a very interesting statement yet. Um, what we want to do is be able to take our small statements and combine them into bigger ones. So, what is evidence, like if, if, we have, if we know what evidence for A is and we know what evidence for B is, what's evidence for A and B? Well, we've got evidence for A and we've got evidence for B. So we're gonna make that with our old friend cons. What if we want evidence for A or B? Well, A or B is the case if A is the case or if B is the case. So we have either evidence for A or evidence for B. And I'll show you how that looks in pi a little bit later. What if we want evidence that A implies B? Well, that's a function. It's a function that takes any old evidence of A and turns it into evidence for B. And it's important that it takes any evidence for A, right? Because let's say I had, uh, I've wanted to say that if two equals two or, um, 
a billion equals zero, then uh, a billion equals zero. I need to be able to deal with either one of those cases. Um, finally, we have equality, which we've seen, where e evidence that x equals y in some type A is this constructor same when x and y are in fact the same A. And otherwise, we don't have that evidence. And more generally, what is the evidence for the statement false? There is none whatsoever. And if we could write infinite loops in any type, then we would have evidence that false is evidence of falseness, and that would make the whole thing morally bankrupt. But we have a few more ways of making statements as well. So, for example, if I want to say that uh, there exists something, then I do that with a special kind of type former called sigma. And what sigma says is it's, it's actually a fancier version of pair. So here, I'm giving the type of the car, or the first thing in the pair, and then I'm giving it a name. And I'm able to refer to that name in the type of the cutter, which is to say the second thing in the pair. So now what I'm saying is that evidence for there exists some atom called fruit, such that this atom fruit is equal to orange, is gonna consist of a pair of an atom and evidence that said atom is equal to orange. So I might want to define this and say define orange exists. And so it's sigma, so I'm gonna say cons because I wanna make a pair once more. And then I'll say cons apple because I'm feeling adventurous. And same apple. But I get a little, I, I, I get a little red X down here. Something's gone wrong. And what's gone wrong is that I tried to say same apple as evidence that apples and oranges are the same. You know we can't do that with apples and oranges. So instead, I'm gonna come back and say, okay, well, it's, it's gotta be orange. But it's still not right, because apple is not the same atom as orange. So I've gotta write orange here. So what we're seeing is there's a connection between the value of the car of the pair and the type of the cutter of the pair. And that's how we talk about there exists something such that, because in order to provide evidence of that, you gotta give the thing that has the property and evidence that it has the property. And we can put these together, keeping in mind that all these types are programs, to talk about what it would mean to have evidence that some number is odd. So in this definition, we say that odd is a program where we give it a nat and it returns a type. And that type is a specification of what would consist of evidence for the fact that the, the very number we gave it was in fact odd. So the way we do that is to say that if a number is odd, then there is another number which is almost half of it, and almost half we write HAF. So, and what does it mean to be almost half? Well, it means that if we double the almost half and add one, then we've got the number we're looking for. And so if I want to say that seven is odd, then almost half of seven is three. So I could say the odd seven, and now I need to say cons three same seven. And now we get our green check mark. Whereas if I tried to claim that uh, almost half of seven was four, then it doesn't work as we would expect. And so evidence of evenness, how might we construct that? In order to get evidence for evenness, we just drop the almost from the almost half. So we can say that for some number n to be even, then we have sigma HALF, because it's actually half, in nat, such that equal nat n plus half half. And if I want to say now that six is even, I can say the even six, cons three, same six. And we see that indeed it is. And now we can solve the age old mystery of whether or not zero is an even number. And 
I will prove to you that zero is an even number. I will provide evidence for the statement zero is even, which is to say even zero. And that evidence consists of half a zero, which is to say zero, and evidence that adding zero to itself gets zero. So that's same zero. And zero is indeed even, at least given our definition of evenness. And not only do we ha are we able to talk about evidence that something exists, we can also talk about evidence that holds for a whole class of things. In other words, we can say for all. And the way we say for all is with pi. Just as sigma is a fancier version of pair in which you can name the car, pi is a fancier version of arrow in which you can name the argument. And then the result type can refer back to the actual argument that is provided to the function. So in this case, I'm going to claim that adding one to any even number gets me an odd number. So I'm saying pi n in nat, which means I'm writing a function whose argument should be a nat, and we're going to call that nat n. Then we're going to reserve, receive a further argument, which is evidence that that very n we passed in is even. And having discovered that that very n we passed in was even, we will produce evidence that adding one to it gets us an odd number. And this is using the uh, version of implies that we had on the evidence slide before, right, where it's a function. And so pi curries all the functions, so I can write one lambda with two arguments here and fulfill the specification up there. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take n, which is my natural number, and I'm gonna take n is e, which is the evidence that n was even. And having done that, I need to construct evidence that add one of n is odd. So almost half of add one of n is the same number as half of n. So I can just take that car and put it right here. And we see that that's a nat. And then I can, and then I need to construct evidence that this number is almost half of add one of n. And I do that using an operation called Kong. Kong is gonna take evidence that two things are equal and a function. And it happens to be the case that if you apply a function to both sides of an equality, then you get back another equality. So it's a way of manufacturing evidence of one, th of one equality out of evidence for another equality. So in this case, we are taking the evidence that the car of n is even is half of n, and we're constructing evidence that it's almost half of add one of n by adding one on each side, and that gets us our add ones. And so plus one, keeping in mind the currying, is our addition function that's only adding one thing. And this is evident, and right now, so we've written more of a proof, right? It says, now we know that no matter what even number we get, one greater than it is going to be odd. And this, uh, we can do a similar thing to go from odd to even, if we want. But now we've got the tools we need to construct something a little bit fancier. And what we're gonna say is that every single number is either even, or it is odd. So how do we do that? So it's got a pi at the top, which means it's a function. So I'm gonna say define even or odd lambda n. And now I'm gonna use my recnat, my good old friend recnat. So I say recnat n. And now I'm kinda of stuck here a little bit. What, what do I type here? Let's, let's put in some placeholders, see what happens. And it, it, all goes, it all goes wrong. And the problem here is that RecNet isn't powerful enough to do the job. So instead we need the, the final, strongest, most powerful way of using a NAT, and that is called InNAT. And InNAT is just like RecNet, except it takes one more argument, and that argument is called the motive. And the motive explains why we're doing recursion. And Pi is smart enough to figure that out if the type doesn't depend on the target, which is to say the natural number that we are doing recursion on. But in this case, the type does, because if we look here, we see that whatever n we're passing in, I need to return evidence that that n is even or that that n is odd, one or the other. But it's gotta be that very n. So how do we make that connection? That connection is made using the motive. And then this either type here 
in, is given by, uh, we can make it in two ways, so I'll comment that out for a moment. So if I want to say the either nat atom, one way I can make it is using left. And if I say left, then I need to give it a nat. So I might say 17. And we get back that that is an either nat atom. But if I were to say right here, then it wanted an atom because right picks out the other type. So I could say instead right of banana and then it also works out. So my motive is going to be a function which takes a natural number as an argument and returns a type. And that type it returns is going to be the type of the entire recursion because it's explaining the relationship between the number that I'm doing recursion on and the type of the value that I'm going to be producing in the end. So I'll say here that my motive is lambda k either even k odd k. And applying that function to n gets us the type that we want for that very n. And now, what's our base case? The type of the base case, which is returned when n is 0, is the motive applied to 0. Because when n is 0, then evidence that it's even or odd is evidence that 0 is even or that 0 is odd. Happily, we actually know the answer. We can say left, because 0 is indeed even, and the evidence is 0 is even, which we defined earlier. And the thing that's remaining now is to do this step here. And as you saw from that mad scrolling, the type of it gets a little bit big. So I've rewritten it in a form that's easier to read. So if I want to define a step for even or odd, rather than taking the next smallest natural number and the result of recursion as an argument, now we need to take the next smallest number and the, the type for the result of the recursion is the motive applied to that very number. And because we're constructing the result for add one of that smaller number, then we need to apply the motive to add one of that smaller number in order to find the return type of the function. So what we see down here is that we're taking pi of n minus one in that. So n minus one is saying, you know, one, one smaller than n. And then we're taking evidence that it's either even or odd because applying the motive to n minus one gets us this expression here. And applying the motive to add one of n minus one gets us this expression here. In other words, if it's even or if it's odd, then we need to construct evidence that the one greater number is either even or odd. So stepping forward one more. In order to define that, we use lambda because we indeed have a pi and an arrow and both of those are for functions. So we're taking in n minus one and we're taking in whether or not n minus one is even or odd so we know which one it is, and we have the evidence. And then we can use an operator called int either, where int either is a lot like in that, in that it takes something of type either, and it takes a motive explaining the relationship between that thing of type either that we are using and the type that we're trying to create something inside of. And so that's e or o of n minus one is taking that evidence, which is gonna be an either. And then our motive actually ignores the target. Because in this case, we are only need to go, you know, we only need to know about, ad, uh, about n minus one here. And so we can ignore it. And then it takes two functions. One of them is going to take as its argument what's inside of left if the thing we're doing the case split on has the left constructor at the top. And that would be evidence that n minus one is even. And in that case, we need to const we, we, we know, right? We, we, we get to use our brain a little bit and think, if n minus one is even, then add one of n minus one is odd. And furthermore, we have evidence for that, which was this add one even odd that was defined earlier using Kong. So I can wrap that in right because right means odd, which was this sub-expression of the type here. Similarly, if n minus one is odd, then our result is gonna have left at the top because add one of n minus one is odd when, or is even when n minus one is odd. And this was the one that I omitted that I explained earlier. 
Now, all of these parts can be put together, and we get our friendly green checkbox. We can see that we're doing in and at on n. The motive is that we want to discover whether n is even or n is odd. And our base case is that well, zero is clearly even. And then we have that step, which looks just like induction steps that you might have had in math class. So that's great. We've constructed evidence that every number is either even or odd. But we've done more than that, actually. Let's take a look at what we've done. What if I say even or odd of two? We, get, we find out that the answer is left cons one, same two. In other words, it's telling us whether it's even or odd by its choice of the left or the right constructor. And furthermore, the evidence inside of that left or right constructor is telling us what half of it is, or what almost half of it is. What if I say even or odd of 45? Then we can see that we get right of cons 22, same 45, because 22 is indeed almost half of 45. What if I'm not entirely sure about 137? That, that's a pretty big number. I can't keep it in my head. Is that even or odd? I can ask. And I find out that that number precisely, 137, it's odd. And almost half of it is 68. Yes. So we wrote a proof. Or at least we thought we were writing a proof. We were, we were constructing evidence that every number was either even or it was odd. But at the same time, we wrote a program that divides by two and tells us whether it was even or odd. Proofs, arguments, reasoning, these have computational content if we want them to. And I think this is super cool. Um, by the way, this was chapter 13 of the book, so please don't feel intimidated. Uh, 15 yes, 13 out of 15. Uh, the other little books all have 10. This one ended up being more of a medium-sized book. But, um, Thank you very much for listening, and if you want to get a hold of me and ask a question about something like this, then uh, you can contact me or Dan, and you can read our book when it comes out. Uh, thanks. I believe we well, have you questions. finished, Ernie. Yeah. So we've got about 10 minutes for questions if you want to have a go at him. Uh, well, a quick one. Uh, you had add dash one. Is that like a constructor for the NAT type, or uh, how is that de defined? Yeah, so in, inside of pi, I'll go back to a slide so that I have something to type in. Uh, we have two ways of making NATs sort of behind the scenes. One of them is to say zero, and the other is to say add one of some other NAT, like zero, for instance. And then we put a little helper on top of it. I should have a line break here. There's a bug in the slides. but. Uh, Right, so, so, and then behind the scenes, if I write 137, it's actually making up a 137 element linked list, essentially. Uh, could I define that structure myself in, no. in Pi? No, okay. Pi is a very small language. Yeah. Well, I guess we take a longer break for 30 minutes. Let's give David oh, another we have hand. Another, uh, oh, uh, can we play with Pi now? So the question was, can we play with Pi now? And the answer is not now, but very soon. By the book. When no, it's published. It's, when is it published? We don't know for sure yet. Uh, <laughs> another one? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the question was, is it reasonable to think of the motive as a type signature? And the motive is present in order to give us enough information to reconstruct what all of the types need to be for the entire recursion. So in that sense, it's kind of like a type signature. Yeah. Um, it, but really, it's telling us why are we doing recursion on this NAT? Like, what's, what's the reason? What's the motive for it? <laughs> Sir, what's the relationship between pi and logic programming? It sort of looks like logical statements you're writing. So logic programming is a paradigm of programming based on doing a large search. 
And that's not what we're doing here. Here, instead, we are providing the ability to construct evidence and then have the computer say thumbs up or thumbs down to that purported evidence. OK. It could be fruitful to combine the two, potentially, in order to have the search problem go out and construct that checkable evidence. Uh, that's true. I guess uh, the underlying question is, um, through Curry Howard, there are connections between logics and types and yes. all this. So, so what, are, what is the logic that underlies pi? Let me, let me ask it that way. Um, higher order intuitionistic logic. OK. <laughs> so why don't you have a search to guide your pi? Because that would uh, undermine the point of making it, which is to enable people to learn how these things work by having a bare bones one that is nevertheless con as convenient as can be within that. OK. And so you once you understand doing... it, you can add it? Can you add your search? I sure hope so. OK, cool. I, I, yeah. OK. Thank you. Is that all? <laughs> OK. Oh, no. Ah, great. Uh, maybe a slightly dumber version of the last question. Um, please, please, don't disparage yourself. <laughs> um, I know how to write a program that divides numbers by two um, or, and, and will calculate the remainder. Um, yeah. Is it possible to use a technique like that to um, use pi to show whether numbers are even or odd? So you can use lots of different algorithms to implement division but you've got to be able to phrase them in a way where they're using these safe recursion operators. This one is the easiest one to do, which is why we're using it. And I think by the time you get to doing that sort of thing, you probably want a fancier tool like Coq or Agda or Idris, where there's a little more automation to take care of the fine details once you understand them. But yes, it, it can be done. So, so basically, to, to do it in Pi, you do want to be providing the evidence of knowing what the number that's half or almost half is. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so the issue is that the normal way you'd implement division, actually, if, assuming that your hardware doesn't have it, which is kind of a ridiculous assumption, but um, what you'd want to do is, like, is subtract something until you can't subtract it anymore. But that doesn't really follow the one-at-a-time structure of the recursion operators that, for the natural numbers. And so you end up having to construct a relation that captures that iterated subtraction property and then write recursive functions over that relation, and it becomes a little bit hairy. How does the motive ensure that the recursion is finite? So the motive doesn't ensure that the recursion is finite. What ensures that the recursion is finite is that every operator in the language sort of preserves the finiteness or preserves the totality. And the way that recursion on natural numbers does that is that it's, it observes that our natural numbers, assuming that the rest of the language didn't make some sort of weird infinite crashing structure instead of it where that was expected, we know that it's going to be a finite number of add one constructors followed by zero at the end. And the recursion operator if, well, if it was zero, then we have an answer, which we get by the fact that all the arguments were total. And if it's add one of something, then we are using the step function, which we know is a total function by the fact that we've assumed it for the rest of the language, and we're showing it sort of one piece at a time. And that total function is going to be applied at most as many times as our add ones, which are finite. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You're not going to throw the microphone. <laughs> yeah, it's too much, too much leaning. Um, so your your notion of sameness involves evaluation. Um, is the uh, is the runtime calculus of pi strongly normalizing? Um, we sure hope so. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say, I mean, you have induction, and you yeah. have presumably a way of representing a stack by way of, of pairs of pairs, right? So you should at least have push down automata, which would imply that. E, like even if it's strongly normalizing, your sameness is not decidable. So we do actually have, uh, so, that, so, so the sameness that you're gonna get is, gonna, is going to be the one you inherit from the particular representation that you pick for your data. You don't get to make your own here, unfortunately. That, so that we'll, so we'll just end up thing. being incomplete, basically. Yeah. Okay. 
So I, uh, I infer that Pi is not really designed for use in production. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, obviously, if you're trying to do um, real calculations with numbers, representing uh, integers as linked lists is not going to be very performant. Not even integers. We don't even have the negative numbers. Sorry, <laughs> natural. Pi is a very positive language. <laughs> Is there a safe way to take your um, logic based on natural numbers and then use machine integers with it under the hood? So machine integers are probably not what you want because they are bounded. They can't represent all the natural numbers. That's true, yeah. Um, but Agda and Idris both have a compilation scheme where they use GMP and set runtime for natural numbers. So. So that's a yes. Yeah. Yeah. You should also mention that Idris is production ready now. <laughs> okay, that's all we're You heard it for. from Buril. <laughs> Not only is Idris mainstream, it is production, production ready. ready. <laughs> Please don't email us for support. <laughs> you can email Edwin, it's fine. Please anyway. leave Edwin alone. <laughs> anyway, that's all. Uh, let's give David a round of applause. Thanks. Thanks.